So then we're gonna start to start the strength of material. Uh, I talked a little bit briefly about the difference between the statics, just one more time. Remember that when we when we were talking the statics, usually what we were talking about was like if I have a beam, for example, and there there and there's some forces applying on that. What I was worried about was that I wanted to know what should be the support that I have here to make it stable. Okay? So that was what we were thinking about it. So if I have a member, how that member would be stable in its position? Uh, for example, and that member doesn't, we usually use the beam because it's easy to see it, but any member. For example, if you look at the door, and that door has a hinge, that the hinge are the supports. So when I have that door, I want to make sure that hinge can hold it in its place and doesn't fall off the hinge uh, and stays there. So that's what we are worrying about it in the uh, 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 statics. In the strength of material, when we go further, we go one step ahead, I said, okay, it is a stable there, it's, it stays there, but is it going to break somewhere or not? Because it might be a stable, it might not go anywhere, but it can break at some point, it can fail materially at some point of that. So, for example, if I go ahead, what I have there, it's a stable, it doesn't go there for <coughs> right, but if I go ahead and increase that force, if I go ahead and say, hey, if I increase F, it just keep increasing, increasing, increasing. Two questions. When the beam fails, when it breaks. And the second thing is that after it breaks, where it breaks. So So up to here is the statics. From here is the strength of material. If it's got a break, under what load it's gonna break or fail, and when it fail, exactly where it's gonna fail in, in that member that uh, we have. And the failure is, can be in the member, can be in the support. For example, if you look at that door, the failure doesn't mean the door fails somewhere in the door. The, the hinge can fail. And it's, it's still the entire thing uh, goes down. If you are uh, designing a part of the car, that part of the car, again, it's the same thing. You want to make sure, the aesthetics point of view, you want to make sure it stays there. But also, you don't want in the middle of the road suddenly, for example, your bolt break and your uh, tire just what's that, goes off the car. You, just, yeah. you, know, you move here and your tire move along to it. So when you have those bolts to hold the, when you're designing for a statistical view, it says, okay, I put in there, I want to make sure that bolt or the support can hold that tire there. But also I want to make sure that if I go in the pothole, it doesn't break. And sometimes when, later on when we talk about it, there's no way in the engineering that says, I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make sure it never breaks, if it fails. So the next step is that, how to make it fail safely. It fails, but at least you know that you're not gonna uh, cause much damage. So that's the entire things that we want to 
core head so from the uh, statics toward the strings so material the <coughs> Now, when we want to see what happened here, is that when the uh, when the beam fails and where the beam uh, fails, what's the very first thing we have to understand? What the beam is made out of. Of course, but it's still uh, another thing. How what happened inside that beam? This is what we want to know. If we want to know what happened inside that beam, so if we want to find out about them, we have to say, okay. <coughs> How forces are distributed inside the beam or any member. So if I want to so if I want to know, for example, the hinge on the door, how if it if it fails and if it fails where it fails, I have to go ahead and see how the force distributed on every place inside that beam. <clears throat> and this is basically what we are gonna do in this strength of material. The very first step on that we start with a very simple format of that. So it's called start to talk about the axial of the stress. What is the stress itself? Forget about the type of it. The simple example of the stress, what would we? Applying force to an object to apply stress to that object. Yeah, but what is the stress? example example for stress is Europe Stress is the force that uniformly, or non-uniformly, doesn't matter. Stress is the force that applied on the entire surface. Look at the pressure. The pressure, when you, for example, you talk about the air pressure. Can I say the air pressure, the entire air pressure applied at this point? Is there any point that you find that the air pressure does not apply on that? So it's like a, remember the distributed load? In 2D, not assume it in the 3D. That pressure applied on every point. So for example, if I have uh, the water surface, and assume there's an object sitting down in the, as the object here. I know that the, pr the pressure, the water pressure is gonna be applying on that and every point that you 
look at it. Any point. Any point that you, any point of that object you look at it, there's a force applying on that. That force that, you, as I said, it can be uniform. For example, if you look at this table, the air pressure is uniform on that table. It can be uniform. If there's an object under the water, usually the deeper the you go, the pressure increase. So if you have an object, usually you have the uh, a smaller pressure on the top, higher pressure on the bottom, because the deeper you go, the pressure increase. It can be uniform, it can be non-uniform, doesn't matter. If you have the force distributed in 3D on the entire object, that's a stress. Okay, so we have a concentrated load, just do one point, and then you have the pressure that any other forces that we can, the pressure is the easiest one that we can probably feel it. That's so how hot does it work. But later on when we talk about it, it's just the stress would be the distribution of the That's the reason. So, is distribution of forces on surface. <clears throat> so, do you get that? So, do you know now what's the difference between the force and the stress? It's exactly the, the force and pressure. So, for example, if you want to, <coughs> the, if, if you look at this table, I said the air pressure applying on that, the air pressure applied on the entire surface. The force from that pressure, what would be? If I add all the pressure together, that would be the force that applied on that table. So that distribution is the stress. If I add them all together, it will give me the force. So any question about the concept of the stress before I go to? Got it? Okay. So the next thing that now we want to go and look at these stresses. You see the pressure is applied on the outside the object. Now we want to go and see what's happened inside an object or inside any member. So for example here I have again this table, the pressure or the force applied on the surface of that. If I cut it in half, what happened inside that table? That's what I want to know. So if I go ahead, assume I have a member, um, a column, looking like this. And I go ahead and put the forces F, F on both ends of them. <clears throat> okay. Now assume I go ahead and cut it somewhere anywhere. So for example, I assume I go ahead and cut it somewhere here. And I will hold down the bottom part. So if I have this, What's the internal force I would have here on that 
section. The internal, we have three, it's a 2D, so we have three internal forces. It's gonna be normal, shear, and bending. What I would have here. I, I just have the normal because there's no side forces so there's not going to be any shear and again because there's no side forces there's not going to be any moment so the only thing I would have is that force and how much it would be if correct <coughs> Now, if I go ahead and magnify this part, so if I go ahead and magnify that. So, if this is my cross section, if I magnify that, I'm going to have a single force like this F there. Is it going to look like that? No. So how is it going to look like? Well, it should be spread out, shouldn't it? Like how it stresses. Because we're not, not everything is just going to be applied to that one dot in the middle. So that's correct. So when you look at it as a pressure, this entire area would be under the pressure. Okay? So as I said, so I will go ahead and say mm -hmm. this one should be equal to equal to <clears throat> something like this. If this is an F, this is kind of pressure or the stress. We are gonna name it sigma. We're gonna name it sigma. And this cross section area, I assume it is A. So how much would be the sigma? Let's put it this way. For the force, if I want to get the force, I have to add all of these together, correct? If I had add all these small, small forces that apply on the entire surface together, I have to get the F. So can I say that therefore the sigma <coughs> is F divided by area? Basically, if I multiply the sigma by the area, it gives me the F. It means that if I multiply sigma by A, it adds all them together. Agree?
So. It is a stress. This is force. And the area, the force apply on that. So if I have a sigma sigma can be zero positive or negative. Zero, we don't care about it. If it is positive, what does it mean? It means that there is stress. There is but what type? Kind of normal. It is. Pressure is then Positive or negative? Positive. Let's go back to the statics. When we have the internal force, compression was positive or negative? negative. Compression was negative. Tension was? So if we have the sequence positive, means that the member is in tension. If it's negative, it means it's in compression. So remember that the tension was positive, the compression was negative, and this the same for the stress. Have the, it's going to have the same. Uh, So, when it comes to the unit, in the SI is relatively straightforward. What's the unit of pressure in the SI? Pascals. Pascals. So, units <coughs> SI is Newton per square meter or Pascal. Uh, so you might have the, depend on the, you might have the kilopascal, megapascal, gigapascal, but just Pascal. But for the US, I'm gonna write them. You have the PSI, which is pounds per square inch. Then we have KSI, which is kilopounds. Then we have it's not it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do with them but I'm gonna just write it there. We have also keep which is little pond. So, so this is the keeps is not for, uh, unit of stress is just unit of force but I just put it there so you know the book used these three abbreviation a lot to so just uh, PSI is relatively straightforward these two sometimes confusing yeah. so let's just put the units of them
So one thing is that look at here. When I assume when I wanted to convert that force to the uh, the stress, I uniformly distribute it over the entire area. Okay, I uniformly distribute the F. I assume that F would be uniformly distributed on the entire area. Is this correct assumption? Is it yes or no? Yes. So, no. It, I mean, it's a yes and no, both of them. It oh. can be correct okay. and it can be not correct. The thing is that if you look at, if again I go ahead and draw that force there. <coughs> if I have this, and then I have my forces at one of that. And if I go ahead and look at it, if, if I cut it relatively to the center, if I, for example, cut it here and show the distribution, the, the distribution is relatively uniform. Very, very little increase in the mean. is usually uniform and distributed. It, it is curved, so this is not a straight line. Make sure you don't draw it in as a straight line. It's curved. But the curvature is not that one, so don't like this. Because at the center, if you look at it, the, the difference between the middle and the side is not much. That's why I said, Let's don't worry about that and assume it's completely uh, horizontal and uniformly distributed. But if I go ahead and get close to the force, where the force applies, what would happen there? If you, the easy way again to understand it is that if you have a pillow and you push it, what will happen? Is the force is going to be distributed uniformly in the pillow? Where is it going to be maximum? Right under where you push it, and the more you get away from that, it's going to become less and less and less. It's the same thing here. Although we don't see it as a pillow, but if the force is huge, and it's that it still can behave like a pillow. So when you have it like that, if you go and push it like that, then it's not going to be uniform anymore. It's going to be smaller when you get away, and it's going to be larger at the center or wherever the force is applied. In this case, in this case, I cannot assume the uniform distribution. What would be wrong if I assume the uniform distribution? Because if I assume the uniform distribution, it means that my stress is somewhere here, correct? Somewhere, for example, it would be somewhere here. So it means that I, there are some points that there are more stress on those points which I don't consider them in my design. And it can, your member can fail there. So if your distribution doesn't change much, you can say, okay, there's not much. We consider it like that and we do it. If we get close to the where the, the force applies, we cannot do that. We have to consider the distribution and go and find the maximum stress in the section to see where the maximum is applied and then uh, do our calculation or design for where you have the maximum stress in the cross section. 
So, but that's why I get people. Any questions? Uh, throughout this course, uh, most of the time we are asking we are like this because it's going to make it uh, way confusing. If you go to the uh, uh, more advanced design courses, then you will go through that. But for now, mostly we stick to this. We assume you are away enough from the forces, so the distribution is uniform. The, the stress is uniform in this field. Um, So look at here, I have that object and everything is central. If I have an object that look like this, Then I have the forces applied at this end. So what's the difference between these two? You have the straight versus you have some bending section. If I cut it here, if I cut it here, but if I cut it here, yep. zero is going to be different. Why? Because I, you said if I cut it here, the force would be off center and it will cause the bending. So if I go ahead and cut it there, what I would get is. If I look at here, although these two members on the applied, uh, are under the force F, when I look at this cross section, this cross section goes under two types of uh, stresses. One stress is comes from the, the normal forces, which is would be calculated from this one, and another stress would, would come from bending, which will be later, a couple of chapter later on, we will get to that, and then we have to combine them together to see how much stress comes from this, how much stress comes from that, add them together or subtract from each other depends on the direction. And then we can say uh, what that you by intuition you probably know that this one will break faster than this one. Because this one kind of bend, so it might break faster. So that's the axial stress. Any question about the axial stress? No.
So, the next type of stress we want to look at it is the shear stress. Assume you have a piece of butter and you put the knife on that and you cut that butter in half. What actually cut that butter in half? Shear force. The shear force from the knife. So that shear force from the knife, when you put it, the knife on the, on the butter and you move it down, is it a single force going down? Yes. Is it? But is that line of force going down? So I assume your knife is halfway in the water. So your knife completely is in the water. Halfway through the water. So where that force applied, the shear force applies to? So it's not in the, in the single point, correct? So it's, it's distributed throughout them. So now let's go ahead and look at, for example, if I have a B. I assume this is my piece of water. And then I will go ahead and I will <coughs> put two forces on that. Go ahead and I will, I will put a force here and a force here. So I assume that that F is your knife. Which F? This F. Assume that. That's it. Assume this F is from the table, is the support from the table. This F force from the knife that uh, cut through it. If I go ahead and cut it in a half from here, so I go ahead and cut it at that section, and then I'm going to have the What internal forces I do have here? Shear. I have shear, moment, moment. Yeah, normal. So, do I have any normal forces? And just from the air pressure and whatnot. But it, it, for for this simple case, no. Okay. We we might have. But here, there's nothing in the X direction. If these two F are close to each other, if to basically, if you look at your knife going down, the support and the knife are going to be right on top of each other. So it doesn't have any moment either. So in the very simplistic way, the only things that I'm going to have is shear here, correct? Okay. that shear distributed in that area. If I go ahead and say, is this a single, again, assume your butter and the knife passing through, is the single point on the butter that said the entire shear applied at that point of the butter, or it's applied on the entire 
cross section that you're cutting it. Very <coughs> cross section. It will distribute it. So if I go ahead and redraw that. This is the F. And I'll say, okay, this is the, this is the B. Then I can say, okay, this is going to be equal to Tiny forces that apply on this. Entire cross section. F here? Yeah. F here is this external one. Okay. So yeah, that's one. But this one, you are correct. But to make the differentiation, is it right? To make, to make sure that you are not confusing. This is normal to the surface. You know that this is normal to the surface. What about this one? That's shear. This parallel to the surface. So it's normal to the surface, to parallel to the surface. To make sure that we don't confuse these two, we call this one tau. Again, I'm not going to go into that later on. We'll go there. That tau is not going to be uniformly. There are some places that's maximum, some places minimum. Later on, we'll um, discuss it. But for now, if you look at it, that tau using that successor is going to be F divided by area. Same again, it's a shear stress. Same for the unit, it's shear force. And it's a area. Last you I have two pieces like this.
and I connect them with the bolt. Then there's going to be a force on them. If I have that, <clears throat> where the bolt is now? If I keep increasing the same I go ahead and keep start to increase the F and increase and increase and increase until the snap. Where is the place now? We're assuming that the boards are basically touching each other. Yeah, you like just bolt it completely yeah. and then you pull those plates away. Here we cut it, but very little cut. It. The, the middle. Yeah. So if it's gonna cut it, it's gonna cut it. There. Correct. So if I want to go ahead and look at that bolt, if I bring that bolt out, that bolt would be happen to be like this. So it's gonna be like this and like this and there's going to be the force applying like F here and F here and if it's going to break, it's going to break there <coughs> yeah. I agree? Now what if I go ahead and make it like this? I have this plate here. And then I have this plate here. here and F here. Now where it's going to snap. So it's gonna snap here and here, yeah? Yeah. So that's right. 
So if I go ahead and draw a silicate snap there. have the middle part and have the bottom part. So <clears throat> if this is the case, how would the force applying on that? I know F would be applied on this one. There's going to be half of it on each of that. So it's going to be on that surface. Mm. I want to put it. It's going to be half of F. It's going to be half of F. While here, if I can try to add more. While here, you have, if this is the one you have F here, or you have the F here. Do you see the difference? So here on the breaking point, half of the force, because it breaks at two points, so the force would be split in two uh, cross section. So but here, the entire force would be on the, on the cross section. So between these two, the force should say this one would snap first, if it's going to be under the same force. Um, any question? This course, we're never gonna have to worry about like how the bolt would be disfigured or anything, because like in how in real life the bolt just wouldn't snap very cleanly like that. But we aren't gonna have to worry about that in uh, this course. <coughs> or really. Usually, uh, no, we are gonna just assume everything would be that clean. Okay. No, we don't get to the local deformation of the object. last stress that we are going to look at is the bearing is uh, stress. We will be uh, going to look at some problem.
assume I have a hole, and then I have a bolt or any uh, any object, and I push that object into that hole and push it. So I assume this is my hand, and this is the object here, goes there, and I push it there. What's the stress between these two surfaces? What's the stress between the in inside of the hole and the outside of that cylinder? That's called the bearing stress. So I have two objects that curve, that go to each other, and they push it against each other. What's the stress between these two surfaces? The inside of the hole and the outside of the uh, the beer. It might be a bolt or anything. That's called the bearing stress. And usually it's calculated as force applying on that is going to be F, if the F pushing it against each other, the so it is a sigma B, but the sigma B, by the way, when they are pushing against each other, is it normal or shear? Normal. It's a normal stress. So we have to use the sigma for that. And again, it's going to be the force divided by area. So the force is, okay, we know the force. But what's the area it's going to be? Two cylinder would be or a half a circle would you push each against each other. The area that we are gonna consider is the cross section area of the so basically what's said the frontal area if you look at it. So if I go ahead and say um, If I say this is the this is the thickness of my plate, and <coughs> that's the diameter of the hole. The frontal area of that hole would be So we had we have phi stress, the normal stress, the shear stress, and then the bearing stress. Any question about any of them? So in the case of like cutting butter, okay. I know that we called that a shear stress, but would that not also be a bearing stress since we're pushing an object into another object? Or do does it have to be like so Bearing a stress is the normal stress like this. It usually happen at the pin or connection. Um, when we are cutting the butter, there's no connection holding each other like this. The other thing is that the bearing a stress is the normal stress. Cutting the butter is shear. All that in your hand? This. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
push it. That's a bearing disc. Yeah. But like, if this you, were... You always has to hold it. You yeah. always has to have something to hold it. If you move your hand, you don't have bearing disc. Okay. So you have to have always holding something else like this. Then it happens this way. Okay, let's look at an example. Uh, uh, we started most likely, uh, maybe most likely I'm not finished, but let's start to look at it. So we are going to have a object like this. Yes, that's all I need. And that is fifty. Fifty is fifty millimeter. And your diameter.
So is the piece on the bottom that's horizontal, is that like a beam and then the other one is like a pipe? Or are they both? Is it rod? Is it, yeah, this one it has a cross section of, yeah, like a beam, okay. square-ish. This is like a rod. Okay. So if you have that, we want to find uh, the stress in each of the member and each of the connections. So we want to find how much stress we have in each of the member and the connection. So what will be the first step? And the support reactions. And the support reactions. So Let's walk a little bit back. If I want to find the stress in, in those members, what should I know? The forces going through them. The internal forces. So I need to know the internal forces in each of those members. Correct? And if I want to find the internal force for each member, I have to go and find out the support reactions. Agreed? Go ahead and start to work on the support reaction. So if I want to find the support reaction, <coughs> in this case, how many reactions do I have here? Two. Two. I have What do I have? A X A Y. What about top up there? And all of them are pin. So that you, this is a pin here, this is a pin here, and this is a pin here. So what do you do? What should you calculate first? Orbit. About A. Or C. Or C. Which one? A and A. A. So if I write a moment about the A, it gives me the CX. CX. M about A zero. So if I write it about A, I have the <coughs> CX times six hundred. Correct. Minus. Eight hundred <coughs> CX is negative forty thousand. So 
sigma of x zero. It gives me the c x plus a x should be zero. So I have negative four d cosine plus a x is zero. So a x would be. So I have the CX, I have the AX. I get, I'm going to get the CY and AY. I can either write one moment or sigma of y. I, I already used two equations, two equilibrium because I can use one more. That one more. If I write a sigma of y equals zero, I will end up with two unknown. If I write a moment anywhere, uh, anywhere that I write it, it's still I want to end up with two unknown. So what is what would you? Could you write the moment of B, then f of y, then solve the two equations? We only can use three equations. We already exhausted two. We need the fourth equation because we have two unknown left. We cannot solve the two unknown with one equation. Where we are going to get the fourth equation? Would we get it from the... Remember when we had the... Uh, cross and, uh, and frame. What would we do when we get cross and frame? Cancel any forces that we can. So we call that. Disassemble. Remember, we, for example, we said for the truss, we just disassemble the entire thing, or for the frame, we disassemble. So we cannot get the, any equation here, so the only way that we can do it is that we have to go ahead and <coughs> disassemble it. So if I disassemble it, let's look at the AB. I'm going to just pull out the AB. It's the AB. What I'm going to have on the AB, the forces that I have, is going to be the AX, going to be the AY, it's going to be that capital here. At the B, what would I have at the B? Look at the BC. I want to have the effect of BC. <coughs> effect of BC on that point. So I, I remove the BC, correct? So I have to replace it. The BC is inclined, so it's going to have two components. Agreed? So it would have two components of that. So I have to replace the BC with two components of BX and by. So bx and by basic, I, I draw it this way, bx and by replace the bc. You got it up to here? Now, how can I solve it? The moment about b. The moment about b. If I write the sigma m about b, what would it give it to me? 
for m about b. It gives him me times. How much is there, why? Is it right? So if I come here, the third equation I could have had here is that the sigma fy is zero. So if I write the sigma fy is zero, it gives me the ay plus cy minus 30,000 is zero. Assume all this is the equation one, so that I can come here in equation one tells me that a y plus c y minus thirty thousand is zero. Therefore, the c y. So now that I find the, the support reaction, I want to find the internal force in those members. I'm going to find the internal force. One way that you said, yeah, I can go ahead and cut it here and cut it there and see what happens inside them. But can I do it easier way? That's correct. If, if I go and cut them, that's correct. It's just probably not the easiest way of doing that. You just find the force. What about I go ahead and disassemble it and put all the forces on joint B? If I if I just draw the joint B, what would I have on the joint B? If I draw the free body diagram for the joint B. So I have that 30,000 going down. What else? <clears throat> At joint B, at joint B, the force of the AB would be also applied on that. One question. These are all three pins. Pin, pin, pin. When we're dealing with the cross, and these are the pin, what type of member they are? Two force members. Remember that? 
So AB is two fourth member. Everything is at A or at B. BC is two fourth member. So everything is at B and C. What was the uh, if you have a two fourth member, what would you have? So AB and C are two fourths members therefore what was the two fourths member there is a one point about two fourths member force applying on them should be along the member. So the force is on those part. Should be along Remember that? So if if I know the direction of force, so for the AB, I can say that said, okay, this is the F AB. I don't know if it's going to the right or to the left. I just put it to the right. But I know the direction is going to be horizontal. And for the BC, again, I don't know that it's going up or down. I assume it's going down. So now that I have that, can I find the A, B, and B, C? What do I need to find the A, B, and B, C? Do you need the components that make up the B, C? Because the horizontal. I'm going to get those components. For example, B, C would just be A, B. If we consider the entire object, yes, but because we disassemble it. So when we disassemble, because we disassemble it, so each part, if the entire object is in equilibrium, each part of that should be in equilibrium as well. So that should be in equilibrium. That joint itself should be in equilibrium. So I can write the equilibrium equation for that joint. So if I want to write the equilibrium equation for that joint, I need that angle. that angle. So how much is that angle? So I know that the tangent theta would be 600 or 800 or 800. That's, this is going to be the theta. If that's the theta, this is the Theta would be how much the theta? Thirty-six point nine. Thirty-six point nine degrees. <coughs> now, if I go ahead and write the uh, sigma f x is zero, what I would have is the f a b. 
minus. Um, Let's try to sigma y zero first. Sigma f y zero. If I write the sigma of x zero, both f a b and f f b c would be there, so I'm going to end up with two unknown. So let's write in the y direction. In the y direction, only I have the f b c. So I have the f b c sine thirty six point nine. Minus thirty thousand zero, so FBC would be how much is this? Forty nine nine sixty five. Forty nine nine sixty five. Yeah. Neutral. And then I can write the sigma of x is zero. So AB minus FBC cosine 36.9 zero. So FAB would be 39,956. So now we have the internal forces. Okay? Now we can start to uh, calculate this stress. And we're not going to finish up in 10 minutes. We're not going to do the rest next time. So look, look at it. So that's the first part. As I said, usually when we are dealing with the problem, the very first part is the entire statics. And we have to do the entire statics to get the internal forces. Now that we have the internal forces, we can go ahead and start to calculate the stress. We'll do that next. Any question for this part of that?